Uh, I'd just like to thank Alex, who's not here, for his wonderful beer, because he always makes a nice beer. So, um, thank you for coming. It's the third Fred no, that's the third. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll just go on to this. Okay, um, 40, I'm 48 years old. That happened recently. I was born on the 15th of April, 1969. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Uh, what we have here is a calculation of how many days you have lived. You can download this app. So I've lived in this world since Tuesday, the 15th of April, 1969, which is 2,507 weeks. But I was born in the Basque Country on Tuesday, the 27th of September, 1994. And it felt like a birth in many ways, because coming on the coach was like a tunnel. It was getting darker and darker, not lighter and lighter. So I don't know where I was being put. Well, anyway. <laughs> to do calculations, I came up with the idea that I'm actually 40, well, I've lived 47% of my life here in the Basque Country. It gets you thinking about, you know, what am I? I've lived almost half of my life here. So am I British? Am I Basque? And what am I? Okay. So, that's the question. So I started to look at the links between the Basque Country and Britain. And specifically, uh, as many things as I could find about where I'm from. Does anybody know where I'm from? Should <laughs> 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 anybody say this? Oh, what about Hampton? Britain's favourite city. So, or everyone's favourite city. Whatever. Everyone. <laughs> 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 is it a city? It is, since, the two, since 2000. The Queen personally made it a city herself. Who? The Queen. <laughs> then the, the wife of that bloke who retired yesterday. <laughs> so the first connection I kind of found with the Basque Country and, and Britain was actually well, it was the first day I came here. And I saw a flag which looked like the Union, the Union Jack, the Union flag, uh, but wasn't. Uh, so what, what is the connection here? Uh, this flag was designed by the, the founders of the Basque Nationalist Party. Uh, what, Luis and Sabino Arana. Uh, there isn't initially they made this flag to represent Biscaya or Biscay. <laughs> represent Biscay. Um, the red. <laughs> uh, well, later it became the flag for the wider Basque Country because they didn't bother making any other flags for the other regions. Okay. <laughs> so the red, the red actually represents the the, the people. It actually is the background of the Biscayan flag originally, but it's the people. The, the saltire, which is also inspired in, in, in the Scottish flag, the, the cross of St Andrew, is green and represents the oak, the tree of Guernica, and the old lords. Yeah. And uh, the cro on top of all that, you've got the cross of God. What they wanted to do here was inspire the traditionalists, people living more in the country, agricultural, uh, traditionalists, and they wanted to inspire also the industrialists, the bourgeois, uh, city dwellers, the, uh, the people who had moved from the country into the cities. And also they wanted to, the, 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 the traditional church belief and the intellectual concepts and you, find, you used to find that the, the bourgeois classes and the intellectual classes in, in Bilbao and the Basque Country were quite inspired by, by Britain. So it was deliberate to make this new flag look like a British flag. They wanted to unite a lot of feelings and, sen and, and sensations there. They're just looking for inspiration. Okay, that was the first time. So I decided to look a bit more. I'm from, where am I from? Yay! <coughs> 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 <laughs> and, uh, uh, anybody from here, does anybody recognise that photograph on the top left? Is that you, Rob? It's, it's <laughs> me on the floor. Ooh. Anybody recognise this? England, Spain, no. Spain, England. Well, Spain, England, in the World Cup in 1950 in Brazil. Uh, it, was Brit it was England's first ever World Cup, because they decided they had ignored it until then. It was inferior, it wasn't good enough for, for the English team. <laughs> They basically decided to go, and uh, it was a bloody disaster. They lost to the United States, 1-0. <laughs> the United States! <laughs> and then uh, they needed to beat Spain to qualify for the next round. They didn't, they lost 1-0. And there was a goal by Telmo 
Sara Nindia or Sara, uh, who played for Athletic yeah, Club right. de Bilbao. The goalkeeper on the floor is Bert Williams, who played for Wolverhampton Wanderers. That's from there. Um, he looks about 60 when he's been in this game. Yeah, still scoring goals. Still scoring goals. Well, they look a bit older in the picture over there. <laughs> That's quite a nice story because when Athletic played a tribute, a uh, tribute game to Telma Farah, uh, they invited Bert Williams to come to the game. And he went to Bilbao and spent fiestas in Bilbao, and spent a lot of time with Telma and his family, and they created a nice friendship, and which lasted until until Dan Moore died in 2006. It's just a nice story. Mm -hmm. well, again, it connects me to where I am. And going into the <coughs> World Football <laughs> Athletic Club. <laughs> what happened there? Why, why did Athletic Club exist? Well, it was British, British workers who'd come here to work. British workers formed a football club to play football. And students from Bilbao who'd been to England and learned to play football formed their own club. And eventually the two clubs <coughs> united and formed Athletic Club de Bilbao. In London, there is a Peña de Athletic <laughs> called Mr. Pentland Club. You might ask, <laughs> Mr. Pentland, who is that? Well, Mr. Pentland is the most successful coach, most successful manager that Athletic Club de Bilbao have ever had in their history. This is going back to the 1930s, but he's, much, he's more successful than Javier Clemente. <laughs> Fact! <laughs> this is the man here. He's called the Bombin because he used to wear this. And when they won, the players used to take it off his head and stamp on it, and he'd have to buy a new one. <laughs> uh, 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 where's he from? He was born in Wolverhampton. <laughs> Another connection. Okay, and that the second picture there is, is him, the tribute game played for him when he was a little bit older. Okay, and that was Chelsea came to Bilbao to play again. Uh, you might say, okay, other British people who've been in, in the Basque country with football were John Toshak with La Real. Okay, but he wasn't the first British manager of La Real. That guy on the end, that charming, beautiful man, handsome bloke on the end, he's called Harry Lowe. And he was manager of La Real Sociedad between 1930 and 1935. He was the first ever British manager in La Real Sociedad. And he's also the oldest player, or the oldest person to have ever played in La Liga. And he played a game because everybody else was injured. So as a manager, he played a game aged 48. And he played the whole game, the 90 minutes. And that makes him the oldest person to ever play in La Liga. Harry Lowe. Connections. Moving on a little bit. Okay, trade. Trade between the Basque Country and, and Britain. It goes back formally to 1474 when a trade charter was signed by King Edward IV and reciprocated in Guernica and it allowed Basque merchants to freely trade in Britain under the and had the protection of the crown of England, and vice versa. There was uh, the uh, English merchants were able to freely trade in the Basque Country. It's gone back 500 years. Uh, in the meantime, there's been a lot of trade, a lot of connect trade connections between Britain and the Basque Country. It's like uh, an early European Union, wasn't it? A little bit. And <laughs> <laughs> um, what we've got here uh, is, is modern examples of this trade between Britain and the Basque Country. And uh, do you notice there's a name of a city up there? <laughs> Walsall. Walsall. Walsall is actually the place where Maya, that my components for uh, for cars, are based. Uh, they're from the Basque Country. They are part of the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation. And they have a factory near. Oh, I'm going to send them this video. <laughs> uh, another example is Iberdrola, the electric, electric company based in, uh, uh, from Bilbao. They bought Scottish Power a few years ago and they have tripled their investment in Britain, particularly in, in renewable energies up in Scotland. And that's one of their wind farms. Good actions. Okay. 
Connections, talking of connections, connected by a ferry. <laughs> Between 24 to 32 hours, you can go on a boat from Bilbao to... Wolverhampton. Not Wolverhampton. <laughs> and it's not Southampton either, where many people think I'm from. Portsmouth. Portsmouth, Portsmouth yeah. Portsmouth. Is it? Oh, okay. They're both. They're both. Okay, I think it's Wednesdays, Wednesdays and Sundays. Yeah. Personally, I've never been. It's actually a dream. I'd like to do this one day. It's nice. Yep, you recommend it? Yeah. Right. Well, if it's moving. <laughs> it's a problem with ferries and water and seas. Yeah. But talking about boats, this boat is much more interesting. Okay. Uh, Civil War, the attack on Guernica, 80th anniversary this week or last week. Uh, what happened here was uh, when the Civil War got really bad here in the Basque country, the Basque government asked for European countries to take their children in. Uh, initially, nobody really wanted to do it because they didn't want to seem, they didn't want to break neutrality. That was the problem with Britain. Britain the British government said, no, 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 we're neutral in this conflict, we can't take anyone. Eventually, the British government took on nearly 4,000 refugee children. Well, from it, was, it was the unions and the Labour Party and the Communist Party. Yeah, you can do a talk on that. It <laughs> 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 wasn't the government. Fine, I'll take it on. Um, basically, the Basque Children's Committee, probably formed by the unions and the workers, basically had to put up money to guarantee that the kids would be able to live in Britain. Uh, so as John said, the government didn't want them to come in but the people put up, basically put up the money for them. And for example, 265, I'll put this one up especially for you, John, 265 Basque refugee children went to Newcastle. Where's John from? Newcastle. Near Newcastle. No, we, we are much more generous. It's 325. 325. <laughs> <laughs> okay, these are flags that you can find in Britain today commemorating these children. Uh, they eventually went back when the Civil War ended. Uh, par actually, the parents said, okay, please, can we have our children back? <laughs> no, there some stayed. There are some cases that some stayed. Okay, uh, now, focusing a bit more on Victoria. A bit, a bit more on Bilbao and that kind of thing. But now, let's focus on Victoria. I've lived uh, most of my 23 years here in Victoria, just one year in, Dano in Donosti. Uh, Henry VIII, the Catholic, Catholic Catherine of Aragon. Mm -hmm. Why? Do you know how they're connected to Victoria? Okay, it's a great story. There's a, 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 the Palacio Escorial Esquivel. Okay, nice palace. Nice. Uh, it was built by the doctor and the wife of the doctor of these two people. Oh, I think they were quite important in their time. Henry's first wife was Catherine of Aragon. She was from Spain. She went over to Britain not to marry this man. She actually went to marry his brother. But his brother died before he became king. So a few months later, when he became king, she married this man, who is famous for having more than one wife, I believe. Um, she asked for a Spanish doctor to accompany her. And the name of the gentleman who went was Fernando López de Escoriaza. He was a successful doctor from Victoria. Wow. He had treated uh, British troops in the past and had saved the life of some general or somebody. And so when the, the new queen asked for a Sp Spanish doctor, uh, he, this guy recommended Fernando López de Escoriata <coughs> from Victoria. He went and he became her wife and he eventually, uh, well, her wife, <laughs> her doctor. And uh, when they got divorced and the Church of England was was created and the, the Pope was thrown out of Britain or something like that. I don't know. I think it's still going on nowadays. Um, he became the King's Doctor. He stayed in Britain. But he was acting as a spy for the Crown of Spain. Of Castile. Eventually they found out he, he was a spy and he had to fake his death and escape. And he came back to Victoria and started building his palace. How did he fake his death? I have no idea. <laughs> perhaps oh, just, what I just said is perhaps <laughs> fake news. <laughs> well, <laughs> dying on the right. More connection. Okay. Uh, the Battle of Victoria. Battle of Victoria. 
Um, the Allied army who came to Spain to liberate Spain from Napoleon originally came to liberate Portugal. No. Anglo-Portuguese army that came. Once, once Portugal had been, had been freed, the, the, the powers decided that they needed to kick uh, Napoleon out of Spain too, so they continued the, the battles and the fights. Um, eventually, they came up to Vitoria, and what we had was a big battle, but it only lasted one day. It wasn't a great, big, huge battle. It was a really quick battle. Um, and interestingly, there were, more, there were more Portuguese soldiers than Spanish soldiers, and a lot more British soldiers. Um, if we talk about uh, three, uh, casualties, I mean, di people who died or were injured, there were about 5,000 men on, on the, on the Anglo-Portuguese-Spanish side, uh, 3,675 British, 921 Portuguese, 562 Spanish. And French losses totaled about the same, and just over 5,000. Tragedy, a human tragedy, like war always is. Uh, here are some of the scenes <coughs> that you can see, painted in the past. This is Gamara. You can still see bullets, holes in buildings in Gamara. Uh, this is a recreation in 2013 of the 200th anniversary in La Puebla de Arganzón, which is the start of the battle, taking the bridge, started the battle. Uh, Inglesmen was basically where the generals were sitting and standing around organising the battle because they could see everything in English Mendic, which is next to Hundith. Okay. Uh, and in, the, in there, in a picture that enacts a conversation between a few guys in Tres Puentes, uh, who is the name of the General, General Alaba? Yeah. Yeah. He was fam he's famous here for stopping the troops ransacking the city. So Victoria, unlike most cities in wars, was not ransacked. Come across. <laughs> he went on to, to fight with the British uh, under under what, uh, what's his name? Wellington, Wellington uh, in Waterloo. So he became quite an international general. Coming towards the end now. Uh, does anybody know who this guy is? Juan yeah. Mena. What's his, what's his job? <laughs> uh, he's a conductor. A conductor. And he's here because he's from Victoria and he's been for the last six years the conductor of the BBC Philharmonic Orchestra. One example of many people from Victoria who've gone on, who've left Victoria, left Spain, gone on to become a very successful international. <coughs> I could go on. In our in the reception, we have lots of examples of particular examples here of connections between Britain and the Basque Country. The coast, the sports, the dancing, the food, <laughs> the wine. Yes. Because can you see that tractor there? Yeah. And that vineyard? Where is that? <laughs> it's just south of Wolverhampton. <laughs> Seriously, and it's pretty good wine. Don't drink the red wine. The white wine, is good. <laughs> and the sparkling wine is lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And the food. The food. That food. That one on the left is it from Devon. Most extraordinary fish stew I've ever had. Oh no, one was better, but that was in Portugal. Mm -hmm. Not really. Let's get to the point here. Okay. Uh, do I feel British or Basque? Um, this is Europe. People move around. Uh, but a few years ago, there was a book published called The Origins of the British by Stephen Oppenheimer. And he spoke about uh, genetic research and he combined it with linguistics, archaeology, and all sorts of different uh, disciplines. And he came up with the idea that the Basques, you can ignore this because this is actually from. The last seven and a half thousand years, when you know everything's as it is now, we so actually go back in time before those farmers and those cultures started moving around Britain in the ice age, when the ice started melting, before the sea level started to rise and create Great Britain and the other island, Ireland, for example. <laughs> 
there were movements of people, but only movements of people where people were. And at that time, people were only in very few places. They weren't everywhere. It was too bloody cold. So it's what's called the <coughs> Ice Age Refuge, the French-Spanish Ice Age Refuge. It's also known as the Basque Ice Age Refuge. There were others in Moldova, some in uh, Italy too. And these population movements basically settled north. As the weather got better, they moved north. So what you get is the original population of what became the British Isles is from Wolverhampton. No. <laughs> <laughs> the, the founding fathers of yeah. Wolverhampton are from the Basque Country. The Basque country. Basque. And genetically speaking, <laughs> you go around different population groups in Britain and Ireland, and 70, 80, 90% of the population will have Basque genes. And they'll be their oldest genes, their mm -hmm. oldest markers. So the British, we've all come home. <laughs> coming here, have come <laughs> home. <laughs> Back to our roots. And this includes the Irish too. Yeah. In fact, the Irish have the highest uh, percentage of markers, that are Basque genetic markers. And you can see it in the, in the Irish, the dark-skinned Irish. Mm. Where does that come from? Mm. <laughs> 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 hey, the book's fantastic. It's a thousand pages, all about genetic material. I recommend it completely, but just read the start and the end of each chapter. Just read the introduction and the summary. Don't read the bits in the middle. So basically, all I want to say here, there's a part of me that has always been Basque. And always will be Basque. I have no choice. I am, at least in a little way, Basque, and I always have been. So, British, Basque, what am I? Brask. Brask. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.